Yeah, just why don't you just tell me about the trip you took to okay. Lewisburg with your dad in the 40s, was it? Uh, probably around about 1944. The first uh, experience on riding the WNOD passenger train was in the, probably 1944. And my dad took me over to Roslyn and we rode the afternoon train up to Leesburg. At that time they hadn't extended the service up to Purcellville. This is after the war when they reinstated passenger service. And we rode that two-car unit that they had purchased secondhand from the Pennsylvania Railroad. That was the first gasoline motor train that they had and we rode up to Leesburg. And on the way up the motor unit was on the lead but coming back the rear car had a open windows in the back and you could look right out the back of the train. So my dad and I sat in the rear seat which faced the rear and we had just a beautiful view of the of the line coming back down to uh, down to Roslyn and we stopped at the different stations along the way and we picked up a few people here and there and discharged a few and uh, probably got back to Roslyn around about 5, around 5.20 maybe in the evening. Now that was my first experience. Now after I got to work and I worked for the Coast and Geodetic Survey Department of Commerce and on Saturdays uh, I had my weekends free so on Saturdays a lot of times I'd come over to Roslyn and ride that afternoon train up to Purcellville, the mail train that had been extended up to Purcellville and uh, uh, the crew on there were uh, conductor John Kelly and the engineer was uh, Foster Ormsby and uh, they had top seniority on the WNOD at that time so they had them they strictly worked the mail trains they didn't work the commuter train that went up in the evening and came back the next morning so I would ride up there and I got to know the crew pretty well and uh, Mr. Kelly uh, let me work as sort of, I guess you might call it a, a flagman uh, or maybe even a porter. <laughs> it, it, it consisted of help uh, with a footstool, uh, helping people on and off the train at the different stations along the line. And we'd get into uh, Vienna, for instance, and slow down and I'd hop off with my footstool and, uh, uh, and help the elderly folks on the train and off the train. And for doing that, Mr. Warnsby would give me a free ride up to Purcellville and back. And of course the management wasn't aware of this, but later on somebody squealed. <laughs> and I don't know whether they thought I was underage at the time or whether I was an employee of the company, but somebody reported to me that I was, uh, that, uh, you know, that I was doing this. So I went over one Saturday to ride the train up to Percival again and Mr. Uh, Mr. Kelly said, uh, he always called me Francis, and he said, Francis, he says, I won't let you be able to help me today. He says, somebody, uh, somebody reported me and he said, I think I know who it was. <laughs> and I often wonder if it might have been Nellie Fletcher, but I don't, I don't know that for, you know, for say. But, uh, so anyway, uh, did, did you I'd still continue to ride the train up, you know, on Saturdays and all, but I paid a regular, regular fare like everybody else, you know. Did but it was a lot, of, a lot of fun, you know. I felt kind of important, you know, helping people off and on and jumping off on the footstool and so forth, you know. And now when you got up to, uh, the train would leave Roslyn in the afternoon, roughly around about a uh, little before two o'clock, and it would get up to Purcellville, and you'd have time up there to go down and get, get lunch at the White Palace restaurant. And the crew sometimes would come down and get lunch too. And you look around Purcellville a little bit, and then the train left, as I recall, at 5.20 in the evening to come back to Roslyn. And that would put you back into Roslyn about 7, I think it was due in about 7.20 or 7.25. It was almost always on time. They were very, Mr. Warnsey was very punctual. He kept looking at his watch all the time to see if he was on time, you know, at the different stations and all. And then I'd get the streetcar there and, and uh, head for home. I lived at that time up in Prepworth off of uh, George Avenue in Northwest Washington. And you had good transportation streetcars at that time, of course, from Roslyn to get back home. And then we had streetcars on George Avenue at that time, too. And then... Did, did you, you mentioned Nellie Fletcher. Did you... One time, one time, one Saturday, I was on the train and Nellie Fletcher was on there and I think she sat in the seat in front of me and she had a clipboard there and she was keeping track 
like the conductors do, of who got on at what station and who got off. Had her own personal little log there, you know, that she was keeping. So I did actually get to meet her one time, and I think uh, Mr. Kelly introduced me to her. So I don't really think that she was the one that reported that I was kind of working on a railroad. I think they probably thought I was underage or something like that, you know. But Mr. Kelly was a very nice gentleman, and uh, he said he, he, you know, he, he felt bad that I couldn't do it anymore, but apparently Mr. Baggett must have gotten the word, you know, and he, and uh, just told him, don't, don't do that anymore, you know, you, you're not supposed to do that, and that's all, that's all there was to it. So I did that for quite a few Saturdays, and it was a lot of fun. It was a real nice trip, beautiful scenery up through Loudoun County, of course, as you know, and at that time, uh, even though automobiles were coming back after the war, they had a fairly, uh, as I recall, pretty good passenger business, particularly on Saturdays. A lot of people going to market, and uh, I'd see the same faces every Saturday. I'd see the same locals riding the train that apparently did it on a regular basis. Can I stop you just a second? Then we got a truck. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the dangers of this place, really. It's, now what I'd like to hear right now would be a freight train come rolling yeah. through <laughs> with the horn slowing, you know, that would that would tie right in with our we'll make a sound effect. with our interview. Yeah. <laughs> so let me know when you're ready to just just anything you like. Uh, um, how long did the train the passenger train what I was gonna ask is how long the passenger trains stay at the stations. I know you said they stopped at Percival for well, post -lit some of the stations ready? were pretty just hold on a second. Oh. Sirens this time. I thought I heard a fire truck, but maybe not. Yeah, yeah there's a fire truck or a police or something. Yeah, there is. Let's wait for them to get by. <laughs> yeah, a little bit more. Good. And he's going to give it to us. Hey, that's great. Okay, anytime you like. Okay, well, you said that you stopped at each station. How long did the train stay in the other stations before they moved on? Well, <clears throat> the two busiest stations, as I recall, were uh, Vienna and Herndon. And they would. And they would dwell at the stations a pretty good while because they would usually have a lot of mail and express. So, you know, they carried Railway Express on the w &OD trains, and they had their own Railway Express agent. Besides the RPO, the mail clerk, they had the uh, Railway Express man. So they had a lot of uh, LCL, less than carload, uh, shipments that the uh, 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 passenger trains carried. So they'd be at the stations maybe sometimes five or ten minutes or so, particularly Vienna and Herndon. I don't recall Leesburg being as busy as Vienna and Herndon, really, but there was quite a bit of business here, and they'd have the Railway Express uh, baggage wagons, you know, that they'd load, load the train and unload the train, so that took a while to do that. You, you mentioned that on the trip back, you and your dad were able to go to that back window. Right. Uh, was there a controller back there? There was a control when they were going in the opposite direction. They, they could operate the train from, from that end. But fortunately, coming back from uh, Leesburg that afternoon, they were using the motor end of the train. And Sorry about that. Pick up where you mm -hmm. Pick up again. We were talking about um, how long they stayed in the stations. Mm -hmm. uh, you said about five or ten minutes in Vienna and Herndon. Usually about five or ten minutes uh, at at these two, uh, at Vienna and Herndon, because they usually had a lot of mail and express to load and unload. And some at Leesburg, and of course at Purcellville, they usually had a truck meet the train at Purcellville, and, and they would pick up the mail, I guess, for star, star routes. And incidentally, on that RPO run there, some of that mail, as you probably know, went to places like Aldi and Middleburg and Philemont, the towns off of the railroad, in other words, were served by that, by that RPO which was kind of interesting. Uh, this is something I've always wanted to ask. That RPO, the railroad post office car, could you actually put mail straight? Oh yeah, it? it had the, all of them had a mail slot, so like if you were here at Vienna and you had a letter you wanted to mail, you could just put it in the slot and then the RPO uh, uh, worker there would see that it got delivered. When they get to Roslyn, it would go into the uh, DC post office or wherever you wanted to deliver. Uh -huh. Yeah, had regular, all of those uh, RPO cars were equipped with mail, regular mail slots. Mm -hmm. did, did Mr. Ormsby or Mr. Kelly ever have any interesting stories to tell you about their time out here? Of what? 
did, did they ever have any stories to tell you that they told you about? Oh, I'm sure they probably did. I, yeah. <laughs> I don't recall uh, any. I do remember Mr. Warnsey telling me that when he started on the railroad, he was underage. He was something like 16 or 17. And he started as a baggage handler at the terminal building in Roslyn, that beautiful station they had in, in Roslyn there. And he started there as a baggage handler and then worked his way up through the ranks and became flagman on the passenger trains and then uh, he was a conductor for, for a while and then he became uh, uh, not motorman but train driver. The, uh, they distinguished between the men that worked on the Great Falls Division and the men that worked on the uh, Bluemont Division. If you worked on the Bluemont Division you were considered a railroader. If you worked on the Great Falls Division you were just a oh you work on a trolley line you know motorman and conductor. So actually, the badges that they wore on the Bluemont Division actually said train driver, not motorman. On the Great Falls Division, they, uh, they were distinguished as motorman, and I have, a, in my collection, I have a badge of both. I have one that says train driver and one that says uh, motorman. Now, train driver actually is an English expression. That's what they still call them in England, I think, are train drivers. So somehow or the other that uh, rubbed off on the WNOD and they decided that they were, uh, you know, more of a railroad. This was always considered the railroad where the other line was just a suburban trolley, trolley operation really, basically. There was, so there was freight traffic on here at the same time? Oh yes, right? and you'd, yeah. you'd have meets. They, they operated, uh, the dispatcher was at Bluemont Junction and I do remember after you left Roslyn and you got to Bluemont Junction, they'd always stop there and pick up orders. That's where you got your train orders and if there were any freight trains out along the line, the meets would be designated by train order. You'd know where the freight train was and usually uh, uh, sometimes uh, the passenger train would go in the siding for the freight train uh, because it was easier with just the one car unit where the freight train might have 10 or 15 cars maybe coming out of trap rock, it was easier for the passenger train to go into the siding than it was for the, uh, for the freight train. But uh, did, did you have any of those meets when you were taking your trip? To yeah, there? occasionally we would, uh, I remember one day we had a meet up at, uh, I think it was up near uh, Ashburn, I think there was a the train coming down probably from Purcellville. And then uh, one time we had a meet up at uh, probably at Sunset Hills and that was a train load of uh, crushed stone, uh, I'm sure, coming out of trap rock. And uh, they, they had passing sightings at various locations along the railroad where you could get in the clear or get out of the way of a freight train. And a lot of people say, uh, ask me sometimes, how fast did the WNOD trains go? <laughs> Not very fast. They could get up to maybe, you know, if they were running a few minutes late, which they seldom were. Now sometimes they could be a little late with the handling the mail and express. They could get up to about 45 or 45 or so. That was about top speed. I don't recall them ever going any faster than that. What did the the, the car do when it got to roads? How did Ormsby and uh, Kelly handle that? To a grade crossing? Yeah. Well, they, the standard procedure even today on any railroad, uh, before you approach the crossing, uh, you blow the whistle two longs, a short, and a long. That's a designated uh, ICC uh, whistle signal for approach to the uh, crossings and uh, they also had bells on these uh, uh, trains so they'd ring the bell besides blowing the whistle they'd ring the bells. Now s certain crossings were very busy and uh, on this end of the railroad they would always stop uh, I think Park Street was a full stop by law you had to stop look both ways before you cross Park Street, the same way with Maple Avenue. This was a very important crossing even back when the railroad was running, very busy like it is today. And they would come to a complete stop and look both ways before they'd go across. Now when they got up into Loudoun County, mainly they'd just slow down at the crossings or, or just give the whistle signal, maybe not even slow down, you know. They were just roll crossings which weren't used all that much. Another complete stop was uh, I believe it's King Street in Leesburg. That was a compuls compulsory stop too, that you had to stop and proceed before crossing King Street, because that was a pretty busy, pretty busy crossing too.
any near misses while you're on the train at the intersection, the grade crossings? What's that? Any near misses with cars, any cars? Uh, I remember one time, at, at uh, and that was a Bay of Crossing at West Falls Church, at Broad Street there, uh, like people do today, not paying attention and, and figure I'm faster than the train is, and that was a near miss, and I know Mr. Ornsey was pretty upset over that. Uh, he, uh, a bee holder, you know, in other words, put her in emergency. And we, fortunately, we missed hitting the car, but it was close. That's the only close call I really re remember, and the guy just wasn't paying attention or thought he was faster than the train, you know. And you still have that going on today. <laughs> Nothing new on that. <laughs> it happens all the time. <laughs> Did any of the crossings have any kind of electronic signs? Uh, I don't read. Now, I understand, and I never rode that part of the railroad because it was freight only. Uh, at Shirley Highway, I think they did have crossing lights at Shirley Highway. And also, I believe at uh, maybe at Commonwealth Avenue in Alexandria, or somewhere in, down in Alexandria, Mount Vernon Boulevard probably, they had crossing lights down there. But on this end of the railroad, I'm trying to think now. No, I don't recall any crossing, crossing lights. They were mostly just a crosswalk, and you use a whistle. You use your whistle, whistle signal there. What was the ins What did the inside of the cars look like? What kind of seats? A lot there was. There well, uh, on the uh, motor car 52, and I think the other cars too. The seats were mostly just uh, covered with black leather, sort of black leather seats, and the cars were. Uh, Equipped for Hall and Mail and Express, and of course the RPO, they, they were sectioned off. You had the motor, motor section, of course, in the front where the engineer rode. And then right behind that, you had like a, a, baggage, uh, a baggage compartment and the RPO section in there. And then behind the RPO section, you had the passenger section. So the passenger section wasn't all that large because they weren't hauling all that many people after the war. And it was adequate. I don't remember ever seeing standees. I mean, there were usually always adequate seats for people, you know. And people were getting off and on at the different stations and all, too, you know. So, uh, they, uh, they really had the equipment they needed. It was adequate to handle what traffic they had at that time. How was the ride? Was it gentle and smooth, or did it... As I recall, it wasn't too bad. A few dips here and there, but uh, they, they kept pretty good care of their track. And their speeds weren't high anyway, you know. And uh, when it comes to bridges, I guess the most memorable bridge was across Goose Creek. Just this side of Leesburg, that was the, uh, one of the more impressive bridges along the line. They had other bridges too, but they were, you know, not like the one at Goose Creek. That was pretty high up. So can I ask you, maybe do that one again, like talk about the bridges and if you can talk about Goose Creek again. It's just. Just as you finished there, that damn UPS truck decided to move. Oh. So, so if you can just put it on. Well, we can't stop UPS. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, why don't you just uh, tell us again about were there bri what the bridges were like crossing? Oh, the, mo the, the most impo uh, impressive bridge along the line was the one at Goose Creek, which was pretty high up. And there were a number of other bridges on the railroad too, but the other bridges were were shorter and uh, you know not not a, impressive like the one at Goose Creek. And also they went pretty slow across that uh, trestle at Goose Creek. There had been there many many years, and uh, I think it probably had been reinforced at one time or the other. But they usually had slow orders, slow orders across there. Didn't sway any, did it? A little bit. Oh, yeah. Those cars would get swinging a little bit, you know, uh, particularly if they got up a little bit of speed, you know. But generally, the ride was fairly smooth. I don't remember it being excessively rough or any up and down motion much or anything like that. And they took pretty good care of their track. I think they had uh, three track crews out working on the railroad at different areas along the railroad there. And they, they, they kept the tracks up pretty good shape, for, particularly for handling freight. You know, you had pretty heavy freight loads, particularly coming out of Trap Rock there. Did you ever meet any of the other employees of the Norm Speed? No, every time I ever rode the train, it was always uh, Conductor Kelly and, uh, and uh, Foster Ormsby. They, they worked as a team. They always worked those, uh, the two mail trains. Now, on the evening commuter train, I rode that once. 
uh, that was car number 45 and that would leave Roslyn around 5 as I recall around 5 something in the evening and go to Leesburg only and tie up overnight so I wouldn't have had a way to get back home so what I would do sometimes is just ride out maybe to, to uh, Falls Church and then I could get the Arnold bus back to Roslyn that was no problem so I did ride that a couple of times just out to Falls Church and uh, and and then I had to take the bus home because the train laid overnight in Leesburg and came back the next morning and it did did a pretty good business at one time hauling com, uh, com, commuters but then people started getting cars and things like that and it's okay I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how much I can hear that almost sounds like a train coming <laughs> <laughs> We got the we got the bridge stuff. Yeah. Uh, where were we next? Well, why didn't you just talk about that? What you were talking about? No, that was kind of interesting. The, the, the distillery and stuff. Yeah. But I guess on your way out to uh, Leesburg and Percival, you went by the Bowman Distillery. Can you oh yeah. A bit about Bowman. Well, I can remember uh, sometimes on a in the summertime. Of course, you'd have the windows open on the on the uh, passenger train and you, you could smell the aroma a little bit, you know, of the, I think it was Virginia gentlemen that they made up there. And I understand that's still made, but it's not made in Sunset Hills anymore. They moved to, a, to another location. But, uh, and I do remember seeing uh, free cars there and all, pretty big, and very pretty little community, Sunset Hills. Uh, originally it was called Wild. Is that the way they pronounce that? Wheel. 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 Originally pronounced Wheel, and then later it became Sunset Hills. And uh, very nice little community. Was there anything when you were, were going out there? Was there anything going on at this little station? Not much. Maybe uh, occasionally, maybe somebody getting on the train there, but uh, and a very short stop, if any. Sometimes they didn't stop there at all. If they didn't see anybody out on the platform, they just uh, keep going. Uh, didn't generate much uh, much passenger passenger business really. I've got, I've got a couple of questions. <laughs> no, number one is, uh, I mean, did did the did, did did the freight tend to take the priority on the line as opposed to the passenger services? We start with that. What, what Steve was asking about was, what was more important? What seemed to be more important, the freight service or the passenger service? Well, the freight, the freight service, definitely. Yeah. On, on almost any railroad, the freight business is, is the money maker. The passenger service was pretty much secondary, except for way back in the, you know, back in the 20s and 30s when everybody rode train, passenger trains, you know, it was lucrative. But uh, no, the freight business was what made, what kept the WOD going as long as it did, really. Uh, and as soon as they lost the mail contract in uh, May of 1951, that was the end of the passenger service right there. They could not operate the passenger service without the support of the, uh, of the mail service. And the mail, the mail contract paid off pretty good. That's why they kept the passenger trains on as long as they did. But once they canceled that mail contract, that was it. They, they discontinued passenger service uh, May 31st, I believe, 1951 was the last uh, passenger train and I was in the service at that time so unfortunately I couldn't make the last last run and I understand that train was jammed to the gills from the newspaper accounts there wouldn't have probably been room for me anyway <laughs> unless I'd gotten there early you know they were turning people away actually they wanted to make that last uh, last ride okay the other thing was um, like I seem to remember reading a story about, or, or reading something, or maybe you told me about how occasionally when you would get to places like Ashburn, they would they would like stop the train and run out to the, you know, run out to the store or something like that. Is that did you ever, did you ever see anything like that? We've heard stories. Yeah, I think Lee, Mr. Lee, mentioned that some of the guys would run and there in in Ashburn there was a bit of a saloon behind the station and yeah I don't recall that that might have been <coughs> back a little bit before Kelly and Ormsby or it may have been well, the freight crew I think Mr. Uh, Mr. Ormsby and Mr. Kelly might have been teetotalers because I don't remember them ever getting off the train and leaving it sitting there while they went over to the <laughs> to the bar maybe the freight crews would be more likely to to do that 
they have more time to with, with a passenger train you have to keep your schedule no I don't recall uh, that incident but it, it probably happened with the freight crews more than likely <laughs> and they were on some long schedules too I think yeah uh, I think they were they worked long hours according hour to days. mr. Uh, mr. Lee like 12 hour days sometimes maybe more and if they had a derailment that they had to take care of that you know but just to jump around a little bit um, you know look the trains, the WNOD's been shut down now for uh, 35 years. Yeah, hard to uh, believe. Mm -hmm. But it seems like there's still a lot of interest. I mean, not just you, but there are a lot of people who really still like learning about the WNOD. Oh, yeah. Hold it. Sorry about that. That's a tr truck. I think that's a truck. I thought, yeah, I thought, oh, I have That might be that glass truck again. It sounds like he's uh, or the right. bathroom. Bank. The inter interruptions you can delete anyway, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Okay, let's try this. Again. Okay. okay. Why do you think the WNOD is still so popular in people's minds? Well, <clears throat> there's a lot of interest in short line railroads. Short line railroads were uh, sort of more more interesting to to the railroad fans and all than some of the mainline railroads are. There's a lot of rail fans that are interested in mainline railroading, but the short lines always had more personality or flavor or whatever you want to call it and the WNOD was a favorite of, of the Washington area rail fans they would all come over and ride the WNOD on like I would on a Saturday afternoon up to just just to take the ride for no purpose except for the enjoyment of the ride up and back and uh, then uh, <coughs> Herb Harwood and uh, Ames Williams and uh, yourself uh, eventually published publications on the WNOD and that generated even more interest and all so it's a uh, it's a railroad that uh, hasn't died yet and then of course the trail has kept it alive too the trail has helped a lot to keep it a keep it alive why do you think the the railroad was so important to the the communities out here the towns and cities well, uh, Loudoun County was always a, a rich, uh, was, not now, agricultural county. And almost every town along the railroad had milling companies and all, and they furnished a lot of traffic to the railroad. There were sidings, and all these towns had sidings for the, for the mills and all, and they did a very good business. Uh, and then, of course, uh, when they were building Dulles Airport, they, they, for a while there, they were doing a very good business uh, hauling uh, I guess gravel or whatever for the runways at Dulles Airport. So that that was a a real uh, money maker for the for the freight end of the railroad too. You know, so they did real well freight wise almost up to the time that they ceased operation, and uh, they figured sooner or later the railroad would would be abandoned. You know, and uh, I guess we're fortunate it lasted as long as it did. Really, you know, a lot of other short line railroads have been discontinued years before the WNOD finally threw in the towel. And then VEPCO wanted the right-of-way too. I think that had a lot to do with it. They were had their eyes on the right-of-way. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, we had a railroad. We don't so many of these dumb trucks in the road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the glass company would be getting there. You know what we should have done? We should have set this up in the middle of the Goose Creek trestle. Yeah. <laughs> and then we wouldn't have had any. I don't know. Maybe we would have had noise too. You never we know. Might, we might have, we might have had you might have had a helicopter or something up there too. You know. <laughs> okay. Now I think we're. Yeah, I think good, 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 good. for the time being. Huh? What uh, What do you think it would be like if the WNOD had had held on for a while? Do you think they'd still be running with passengers and and if they could have held on another 10 or 20 years? Well, it's sort of hard, hard to tell. They, uh, more and more people have automobiles now and whether they would have developed any kind of commuter train service or not, a lot of people think maybe they would have. It's sort of speculation. But, uh, I, of course, there again, they had discontinued passenger service twice in 1941 originally. April 1941 and then in May of 1951 and I don't think they would have been anxious to get back into it again. Now if a transit authority like Northern Virginia Transit Authority or somebody like that had taken it over they might have made a go out of it. I mean uh, the way these communities are built up now along the railroad I would say uh, 
that a commuter service would uh, maybe be successful. But then again, it would have to go beyond Roslyn. You, the people don't like to transfer from one, one train to another, so you would have to have some system that it could have gotten into the, into the city some way, and, or hooked up with Metro, or something like that, maybe at Biana here, or, you know, might have worked out. But it had been discussed, by the way. Different groups had discussed the possibility of putting commuter rail in, but it never got beyond the talking stage. Like this Dulles, uh, Dulles Airport uh, light rail line has uh, been in the talking stage for how many years? 10, 15, 20 years maybe? <laughs> and we still haven't seen it. So, you know, speculation. Well, I guess it sounded like you really liked the WNOD. Oh, it was always one of my, uh, I guess one of my favorite uh, uh, I was always interested in electric railways. Now, unfortunately, I never got to see the WNOD as an electric railway. But uh, my favorite line, of course, was the Hagerstown and Frederick, which operated out of Frederick, Maryland, and I also rode that many, many times. But the WNOD was my favorite uh, hometown railroad. It was close to where I lived, and it was easy and very accessible to get to. So it was one of my favorites, definitely, and I still collect a lot of WNOD memorabilia. And, and thanks to Paul McRae, he's come up with a lot of uh, interesting items uh, items to add to my collection. We said in '51 when the passenger service shut down, you were in the army or in the military. I was I was in the service at that time, so my, I remember my mother sending me all the newspaper clippings and uh, all they had. It really got a send off in uh, May of 1951. All the newspapers had big photo spreads and pictures and everything in there at that time. Uh, uh, Mr. Kelly apparently had retired, and uh, Mr. Ormsby, when he uh, uh, he late uh, he left train service sometime, probably I might have been when I was in the service, or, or when they took the mail trains off, and then he went to work in the office at Roslyn there for a while as a freight freight accountant. So he he was out of train service, and of course Mr. Kelly I think had. Was, which was older, had I think taken his retirement. So uh, there was a different crew on the, uh, I don't remember the crew on the trains in the, say, I went into service in October 1950, so I don't know who was running the, I think uh, uh, Dorf Cunningham was the, uh, was the engineer on the commuter train, the one going up to Leesburg and back uh, toward the end. They took over from uh, uh, from Kelly and Ornsby, but uh, Mr. Kelly and Mr. Ornsby had been on that mail train since, oh, well, probably back in the in the mid 30s, up to the uh, up to about uh, probably 1950 or so, somewhere along in there. And uh, Th were you out, were you out in the military by 19 by the time the railroad closed? What's that? Were you out were you out of the service before by by the time the railroad closed? Were you out in the military by that time? By when, did you, when did you come back to the area from? Uh, the let's see. I was discharged about uh, November of 1952, mm -hmm. and of course by that time the railroad was back to freight service only. So I didn't see much of the railroad after I came back because uh, there were no more passenger trains to ride. So I guess the question is, I'm trying to get was what was kind of the mood in the area when they finally closed? Okay. Yeah. Well, when you got back from the service and they had closed the passenger service down, mm -hmm. how did people feel about that? Did they feel like they were missing it, or? I really don't know. Uh, you know, it had been a year or so. It had been going about a year or so. I doubt it very much because almost everybody had cars and uh, uh, three-car families. You know, the, the, the son, the mother, everybody had a car. So really, I don't think they missed the railroad that much. Even back then, really, they had all those cars. You know. And of course, it was freight only, so I pretty well lost contact of it after I got out of the service. And, and then the CNO, when the CNO took over, it, it got, uh, I don't know, to me, it seemed to uh, get le uh, less interesting because they used those CNO engines, which weren't painted up very good anyway. And the WNOD engines were sort of being retired from service, so it wasn't the same railroad once the CNO took over. And once they found out that the power plant wasn't going to be built on the Loudoun County side, they built it over in Dickerson instead, over in Maryland. They lost complete interest in it, and from 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 that time on, they just wanted to get rid of it. You know, they, uh, so one, once they lost that uh, 
the thought of the power plant coming in. That would have been big business for them, you know, the power plant. And once that, uh, they changed their mind on that, that was pretty much a hand writing on the wall to get rid of it. So can, can you expand on that just a little bit so that we've got a, a storyline for that as well? Like the, the power plant, the whole power plant business? Yeah, we, we wanted to tell that as part of the story about how that power plant was planned and the CEO yeah. was going to get... Well, the originally it was planned to be, uh, uh, I guess it was political like everything else. It was to be built somewhere in Loudoun County. Now, I don't know exactly where it was going to be built. But apparently the politicians in Maryland got wind of it, and of course they were battling back and forth, and Maryland won out. And uh, that's why it's at Dickerson where it is today. They decided to put it over in Maryland, and uh, which is served by the, uh, uh, what was the B&O, it's uh, CSX now, serves, serves that, and that plan up there. And so good for the WNOD to have gotten the coal contract to that, to the power plant. If, if it had been built in Sterling, why would the WNOD have done so well? Well, just off the local traffic, they hauled a lot of building material. They, the, at that time, uh, these areas were getting built up uh, north of Vienna, up through Herndon, Sterling, up in that way, and they did a tremendous bill. Barber and Ross, I think, was one of their big customers. They hauled a lot of building material on the railroad. Uh, not so much farm products as building material. So they did pretty good. They had a pretty substantial freight business, enough to turn a little bit of a profit. Once it started, uh, they weren't making a profit on it anymore. Then they, that's when they decided to, to get rid of it, you know. But it did pretty good. Uh, even though they didn't get the contract for hauling the coal to the power plant, which they didn't get, they did pretty well, really. That's and a good storyline. Another interesting thing is when there, when there was talk of abandoning the railroad, they had a WNOD users committee, and they really fought hard. They fought down to Richmond and all, sent representatives down to Richmond to fight this abandonment. They didn't want to see the railroad go. So uh, they put up quite a, quite a fight, but uh, unfortunately they didn't win it, and uh, the railroad uh, was abandoned anyway. Uh, 1968, I believe, wasn't it, when the last, last train ran. So uh, they didn't want to lose the railroad, and of course, uh, it was more expensive for them to truck. They had to convert to truck, you know, once the railroad quit, and that, that was a more expensive proposition. The rates on the railroad were apparently a lot more reasonable than having to go into trucking and all. Do you remember so, back in 41 when they were trying to shut down the passenger service? No, no. I, my, like I say, my first uh, introduction to the WNOD was that trip with my dad that time. One interesting thing I should mention, I, I can actually say I was station agent at Falls Church for one night. <laughs> and uh, what happened was Mr. Love was a station agent at Falls Church for a number of years, an elderly gentleman. And my friend Sam Anderson, who lived in Falls Church at that time and was a WNOD fan, we used to hang around the station there a lot at night and watch, I think it was train number eight, come back on its way <coughs> from Purcellville into Roslyn. We'd get to Falls Church around about around about seven o'clock, somewhere along in there. So uh, Mr. Love was there one night and he wasn't feeling good, he was feeling pretty bad. And he said, I wonder if you fellas would do me a favor. He says, uh, I get the baggage wagon here and he said, we got all the mail and express and stuff to load on number eight. And he said, uh, I, I've got to go home. He said, I'm feeling terrible. He said, would you, would you guys hang around long enough for the train to come in and see that this mail and express is loaded on? So we told him we would. And he said, I've got the key. So he said, after the train leaves, just slip the key underneath the door, the door of the station there, you know. So uh, after a while, number eight showed up. And uh, of course, Mr. Lawrence, he was an uh, engineer on there. And we had the baggage wagon placed along the track there, but apparently it was a little bit too close to the track. Unfortunately, Mr. Warnsby from the cab of the, of the motor car 52 it was, and that was kind of wide. 52 was a little bit wider than some of the other cars. And he stopped and he said, you're probably gonna have to move that baggage wagon out of the way a little bit. He said, I don't think I'm gonna clear it. And he may not have. And <laughs> so anyway, uh, he and I think Mr. Kelly got off and they helped us to kind of heavy. They helped us to shove the baggage wagon back, maybe about a foot or so, to clear. And then uh, they pulled the train up alongside the, bag the baggage compartment. We loaded all the mail and express on there. So then after the, uh, 
we had to get get on that train by the way to go back to Roslyn so we uh, one of us ran over and slipped the key underneath the station for Mr. Love to get the next day and then we uh, got on a train and rode on down into Roslyn so uh, we claim we were unpaid station agent for one night so that was kind of an interesting experience you know we weren't expecting that 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 was going to happen that particular night but it did and everything got on the train okay and got delivered in Roslyn usually they have the the mail truck would be in Roslyn to meet the train when it got back so the, the post office would send a truck over to pick up the mail and and then the railway express wagon would be there also to pick up railway express they'd always be there when the train got into Roslyn and they'd all also be there early in the afternoon maybe a half hour before the train was due to leave to come up to Purcellville to load to load anything on that, that was coming up on the train and they were very punctual they were always there you never had to wait on them you know I think I have the news article clipping from when Mr. Love got his job, which was ways back. Yeah, I believe he lived in Falls Church because he walked home that night. I didn't see him getting in a car, but he was really feeling bad. And I don't know, he uh, he might not have lived too much longer after that. I don't really know. But uh, he he used to see us around, you know, nice old gentleman. So we told him, sure, that's, uh, they said, no problem at all. They said, uh, so... Uh, Did you ever... As I recall, we had a lot of a lot of uh, uh, Mail and Express on that baggage wagon too, quite a bit. It took them a while to maybe five or ten minutes to load all that stuff on, on there, you know. But I'm glad Mr. Ornsby discovered that that was a little close to the, to the, uh, you know, you, you don't figure clearances sometime, you know. But I'm glad he he saw it. He was very, he was pretty sharp, you know. I mean, he was very attentive, very attentive to his job, you know. He took it very seriously, very seriously. He really did. I know sometimes when we get to West Walls Church, he'd almost stop there, you know, Broad Street, and he'd get out, uh, almost lean out of the engineer seat and look both ways to make sure nothing was coming before he'd go across there, you know, not taking any chances. That was a bad crossing, that one at Broad Street. And in the electric operation, they had one bad fatality there. I believe you have the clipping on that where they actually killed a guy, one of the electric trains. And the guy didn't stop, and it, uh, the electric train was going slow, but it, it plowed into this automobile, and the guy was killed. He was trapped underneath the uh, pilot of the uh, inner urban car. So they had their problems uh, from time to time. But uh, well, whenever I rode it, I don't remember any incidents where we ever struck any cars or anything. It was just a normal routine trip up to uh, up to Purcell going back. Did you know anybody down at the Roslyn end of it? Any of the, no, the one gentleman I used to hear his name mentioned a lot, I never got the meeting, was Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey was the uh, sort of general car shop foreman down in Roslyn. He was in charge of repairs for WNOD. And he, uh, he's, uh, as they say, he's the man that kept the, uh, kept the cars running. He kept the trains running. If anything was wrong mechanically, uh, he'd have them fixed and on the road the next day. But I never got to meet him. Charlie Bailey, I think, was his name. And that shop building was very, really inadequate for the railroad. It was very cramped down there. They didn't have much room to work in there. I, I walked back in there one time. Very cramped conditions. To, they did have a pit like where they could work underneath the equipment, but uh, very, really inadequate for the amount of equipment they had. I found a purchase order in this new file. Uh, that building was moved from Washington. That's what I understand. It was originally part of the uh, train shed over in uh, Georgetown, over there. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, uh, she had an estate up there in uh, near Leesburg somewhere, and I don't know how often she rode the train, but she just uh, apparently she argued that in the original charter that the railroad would always have to furnish passenger service or something like that. Boy, it's an eternity. I don't know how true that was. And she would go down, she was always down at Richmond for the State Corporation Commission hearings, anything on WNOD. Nellie was down there. <laughs> and of course, Mr. Baggett would be down there too. So I think, <laughs> I don't know whether there was a very good relationship between Mr. Baggett and Mr. Uh, and Nellie Fletcher or not. Uh, Nellie Fletcher was sort of a thorn in their side, I think, because <laughs> yeah. they were trying to get rid of the passenger service. And so, 
Can, can we just go over that bit again? As you were rubbing there, you were rubbing the microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I so forgot that. Uh, yeah. about, talk about when they were in yeah. Richmond. So, uh, anyway, uh, Nellie uh, would always go down to uh, uh, Richmond for the State Corporation Commission hearings whenever they were talking about train offs. And she always argued that uh, in the original charter that the railroad would always have to furnish uh, uh, passenger service. That was in the charter, and she argued that back and forth. So uh, uh, when she started riding the, riding the trains, uh, she would keep track of uh, just to, to, so she'd have figures to take down to Richmond. How many people got on? Well, I can prove how many people are riding the train right here, see? So that's why she did that. She kept her own personal personal record. Now, I think Mr. Baggett kept his own personal record, too, which might not have coincided with uh, Nellie Fletcher's. <laughs> there could have been some d discrepancies there, you know, in the figures shown. But she was quite a colorful uh, colorful lady, and uh, I don't know when she died. I think I have in her, her obituary. I think I saw it in the Washington papers at the time that she died. But I don't know that she really so rode the trains that much. For hold on a second, Fred. Oh, yeah, that the truck. truck's uh, going in. Yeah. FedEx one, I think, this time. Oh boy, that is a big one. Yeah. I don't know what he's hauling, but he's got a. Looks like concrete blocks or something mm -hmm. like that. If you could just pick up again, um, just where you said she, you know she was a colorful character, and just really from the, from that point on. Well, she. Uh, any time there was anything on the W and O D in the in the newspapers, and of course they got a lot of coverage at one time with this passenger service bit, and her name would always be mentioned. And uh, like I say, she had an estate up near Leesburg somewhere, and she really uh, fought the railroad uh, hook, line, and sinker to keep these passenger trains running. And uh, I don't think they were doing all that great toward the end, but uh, she insisted that, so she never missed a meeting in Richmond. She would always show up at these State Corporation Commission hearings in Richmond with her notebook and ridership list and what have you. Did you get the part about, and, uh, we talked about she would take counts, did that come through? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. That was good. Oh yeah, I can remember her clipboard there, <laughs> keeping the, and not only who got on, but who got off at these different stations along the way, you know. and. Uh, and a buddy of mine from Baltimore, who uh, one of my best friends, he, he was a WOD fan. He used to come over from Baltimore sometimes and ride that afternoon train. And it just so happens that on one of the trips that he made, Nellie was on the train. So he got to meet Nellie Fletcher too. So we both did. And uh, I would say she was a lady probably uh, at that time, probably in her, I would say in her 60s maybe, somewhere along in there. Hoping to find a photo of her in one of the newspapers. Yeah, now I don't know whether I've ever seen a picture of her or not. I'm sure she must have been pictured in the newspaper one time or the other. Yeah. Uh, no. I do know at one time, if I can find it, either the Washington Times or the Washington Herald had a picture of her getting ready to board the auto railer in Roslyn. And this was before they put the passenger service back on in March of 1943. And apparently she was making an inspection trip. They let her ride this auto railer to uh, up the line, just uh, sort of like an inspection trip to see where the stations were going to be and the stops were going to be and so forth. But I've never been able to find that clipping. Uh, but I do remember seeing it at one time. And uh, uh, these auto railers were used like an inspection inspection cars. If so, you find it, let me know. So she was always around the railroad. She was very visible, you know, and. Uh, I think that's great. I think we've got pretty much, I can't think of See, after the railroad, yeah, this would have been probably after the railroad discontinued passenger business, and after I got back out of the service, I found out that if you went over to Roslyn to their general offices over there, which incidentally were up over a loan company, <laughs> or a porn shop, that they had tickets and WNOD memorabilia they'd be more than happy to give to you. But you'd have to come over there and, and, and pick it up. So I went over there one day and remember climbing this steep flight of steps up to the second floor and they had their freight accounting office up there and this lady, uh, I told, uh, asked if she could help me and I said, yeah, I said, I understand that you have some WOD memorabilia and I said, I'm very interested in the WOD and she says, oh my, she says, 
come on back here. So we went back and little room there and she got a big manila envelope out and man she filled it with ticket books and timetables and all sorts of memorabilia. She said we were thinking of throwing this stuff away. But she said well, somebody said oh why don't you hold on to that. She said the rail fans would give their right hand for some of this material you know. So, so, they, so they did. So the word got out and uh, uh, they didn't have a run on the stuff, but anybody that wanted it, you, all you had to do was just show, go over there and they, they would give you the, uh, the whatever they had material. You know. So she gave me a big, when I walked out of there, I had a big fat envelope full of W&OD memorabilia. And ticket books, for instance, that had never been used on the Great Falls Division in mint condition. Uh, still had the wrappers around them that they had never even been broken, you know. So they were a very friendly railroad, you know. One thing about the WNOD, a lot of short line railroads were, were very friendly and would give you permission uh, if you uh, were willing to sign a release to let you ride on the locomotive. Like even on the freight trains, uh, the only requirement was to sign a release in case you'd get hurt. That would relieve them of any responsibility. But the WNOD was very strict about that. They they would not let you ride the freight trains. Period. Uh, that was uh, strictly off off limits on that. They they would not do that, which is just as well because you're not really supposed to be riding a freight train anyway. But a lot of short line railroads would extend the courtesy to let you do that, you know. But the WNOD was very. I don't know of any railroad fans, unless they work for the company, that ever really got permission to ride ride on one of the locomotives. But, uh, okay. Oh, okay, yeah. Amber, yeah. really? In the, you ready? Yeah. In the, uh, in the cold weather, uh, sometimes, uh, they, they had a, like a, sort of like a coal stove on that mo motor car number 52, and, and Mr. Kelly had a little bucket of coal there and a scuttle, and when, when it get cold, he'd, uh, shovel, shovel a little bit of uh, coal into this, uh, furnace thing like to heat the uh, gas electric car up and it kept it nice and toasty, nice and warm. And I do remember seeing him doing that, uh, particularly when it would be a chilly day, you know. So uh, that's how they heated the car up, among other things. It probably had heat from the engine too, but they had that little stove in the passenger compartment and he would uh, warm it up. And I can remember him putting his gloves on and shoving a few scoops of coal into the, into the firebox. <laughs> Or stove. 